Hello! In this video presentation, this short lecture, I'm going to try to provide an introduction to valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, or VSEPR, or VESPER theory. VSEPR stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion. VSEPR theory is based on molecules, and in particular, the valence electrons, how those electrons interact. So let's take a look first at what I mean by the distribution of electrons in the valence shell. Well, valence shell electrons in molecules fall within two simple classes. They're either bonding or non-bonding pairs. Look at this first example um, of methane, CH4, a carbon atom surrounded by four hydrogen atoms. The carbon atom, like each of the atoms in the second period of the periodic table, reacts until it has a full octet in its valence shell. The elements in the second period, carbon to fluorine, all can be understood to react until they have filled octets in their valence shell. So in this first example of the methane, the carbon atom has achieved a full octet by entering into four bonding interactions with four separate hydrogen atoms. And remember that in each chemical bond, which is in, in, indicated by this um, line between the atoms, represents one shared electron pair. So there are two four, six, eight electrons in total, and one, two, three, four bonding pairs. Now carbon does not have any non-bonding electrons around it. Let's look at the next example, ammonia, or the NH3 molecule. As previously, each line between these atoms, between a nitrogen and a hydrogen, represents a shared electron pair. So there are three bonding electron pairs. However, the nitrogen also has a non-bonding electron pair. So there are two electrons in this non-bonding pair, and those two added up to these other six account for all eight of the electrons in the valence shell around that nitrogen. Fluorine. Well, if you remember, fluorine has seven valence electrons, and it completes its octet by forming one bonding in by having one bonding interaction with a hydrogen atom, and so it has one bonding electron pair, and one, two, three non-bonding electron pairs. Now, how do valence electrons interact? Let's think a little bit about how electrons interact with each other. Well, electrons, as you understand, all are identical and always have the same charge, which is a negative charge, minus one charge. Electrons are attracted as negatively charged particles. They are attracted to positively charged particles, including, of course, the nuclei of atoms. So if we're looking at a very simple diatomic molecule, say, such as a hydrogen H2 molecule here, and we think about the electric forces, those electrons are attracted to the oppositely charged nuclei. And in fact, it's this attraction of the electrons in this internuclear region to both nuclei that gives the molecule stability. However, we also need to think about the repulsion between electrons. So these electrons also see each other in an electrical sense, and they have a repulsive force between them that also factors in to the overall stability of the molecule. And if electrons have the opportunity to move around, they will move around and find a geometry in which those electrons will try to get as far away from each other as they possibly can. Now these two electrons, um, say if this is a ground state of a hydrogen atom, they can't exactly get too far apart from each other. However, when we're looking at electrons that exist in separate orbitals 
within a molecule, specifically in the valence shell of an atom in a molecule, we will see interesting things happen as those electrons try to get away from one another. And when electrons, which exist in pairs, try to get as far away from each other electron pairs as possible, that ends up influencing shapes of molecules. So let's define something that's called the steric number. The steric number is the total number of valence electrons around an atom. Now we've broke valence shell electron pairs into two kinds, bonding and non-bonding. Remember our example of the CH4 or methane molecule. It has four pairs of bonding electrons. Now to find the steric number, we have to add to that number of bonding electron groups the number of lone electron groups. And in the methane, that's zero. So the total of those is going to be the steric number, which is going to be four. Ammonia, NH3, again, how many bonding electron groups? One, two, three. So there is three. How many non-bonding groups? Well, there was one pair. Add those up, find a total, the steric number of four. An H2O molecule. So let's look at the central oxygen atom. How many bonding electron groups are there? Well, there's one, two. How many non-bonding electron groups are there? Well, around that oxygen, there's one, two again. Let's add those up. And what is the steric number? Or, so even though these three molecules have some very major differences between them, they, however, have some common denominator. They all share the same total number of electron groups around the central atom. So let's go on to talk about what exactly that is going to control. Here's a few more examples first of calculations of steric number. And I've chosen a few here that will show us some interesting um, cases. So here's a formaldehyde molecule. Okay, it's got one, two, three atoms around it. In terms of the bonding electron groups, we count that as three. Even though this one atom has two bonds, or in other words, is double bonded to this carbon, we count it as one bonding group of electrons. How many lone electron groups do we have around the central atom? And now, don't forget that this carbon is the central atom. The oxygen, which does have lone electron groups, is really oh, just on the periphery in the surroundings, part of the bonding environment of the carbon. And we're just looking at the central carbon atom. So how many lone electron groups are here? Zero. Add those two up to get the total number of, ele of electron groups around that carbon. And that's a steric number of three. Here's another example, interesting example. Let's look at this tellurium atom, which is a central atom in this TeCl4 molecule. Now, how many bonding electron groups are there? One, two, three, four. How many lone electron groups are there? Well, there's one, which would add up to give it the steric number of five. Now, this is not exactly a tricky example. We looked at something very similar when we did the NH3 molecule, with there's one lone electron group. But however, I wanted to, sh to uh, use this example to show you a case in which the steric number was higher than just four or three, we're going to consider steric numbers that get that are even higher than this. So let's look at the xenon atom in this XeF4 molecule. Now how many bonding electron groups are around the xenon? Well, there's one, two, three, four atoms bonded to the xenon. So there must be four bonding electron groups. How many lone electron groups do we see around the xenon? Well, two, which add up to a net steric number of six. Now that we now know how to calculate steric number, now that we have seen that there are different values of steric number, let's see what that 
means. So we're going to be considering steric numbers that range from 2 to 6. So let's work through these individually and have a little look at them. So steric number, let's start here with 2. So here's a diagram which shows, well with a little imagination, a nucleus surrounded by two electron groups. So basically you've got a central point which is the nucleus which has two big electron groups around it. And these electron groups basically represent objects that have negative charge and since they have the same negative charge they repel each other as we discussed and try to get as far away from each other as possible. So these two, if there's only two groups around the central point, they will adopt a linear arrangement. They will be oriented at 180 degrees to one another as they try to get as far away from each other as possible. Anything other than 180 degrees would bring them closer together than this. Let's work our way up. Steric number of three. So here's a nucleus that's surrounded by three electron groups. As they find a geometry that gets them as far apart from each other as possible, they will adopt a trigonal planar arrangement. Generally, we will use the word trigonal whenever we're looking at a shape that has three points, three sides, I guess. You can imagine a triangle with three separate sides. And these three sides all lie in a plane. So this is a trigonal planar arrangement. I think the name is self-explanatory. Those three items getting as far away from each other as possible. When steric number is four, those four electron groups will adopt a so-called tetrahedral arrangement. You may have heard the name of a shape called a tetrahedron. Well, a tetrahedron has four vertices and has four sides. That's steric number of four. So whenever you have four electron groups, they're going to arrange themselves in space into a tetrahedral form. And now keep in mind that at this point, we're only discussing electron groups. We haven't specified whether these electron groups are bonding or non-bonding groups. We're only talking quite generally still. If there's four groups, those four groups will arrange themselves into a tetrahedral shape. If there's a steric number of five, five electron groups around a central point, a central atom, those five electron groups will arrange themselves into a trigonal bipyramidal or trigonal bipyramidal, however you want to pronounce it, arrangement. The trigonal bipyramidal arrangement gets those five electron groups as far away from each other as possible. There's just no, no shape that those five groups could adopt that would have lower repulsions than that. This is an interesting shape. There's actually like two angles between electron groups. And to describe this, I will differentiate these three electron groups that sort of lie in a plane from these two electron groups that lie above and below that plane. These three that lie in the plane are often referred to as the equatorial electron groups, whereas those electron groups that are above and below that plane are referred to as the axial electron groups. Those electron groups that lie in the equatorial plane have an angle of 120 degrees with respect to each other. However, there is only an angle of 90 degrees between an electron group that's axial and an electron group that's equatorial. Steric number six. Wow, we're at the top. We're at the highest steric number that we're going to be learning about. When there's six electron groups, they arrange themselves into what's called an octahedral arrangement. Why is it called octahedral? For very, very similar reason as that shape that we looked at previously with steric number four was called tetrahedral. Tetrahedral had four sides. Octahedral has eight sides. So one, two, three, four are visible here 
but there's four other sides around this, and so a total of eight sides. And so there are one, two, three, four, five, six vertices to this shape, and a 90 degree angle between all electron groups.